Rejoice, the Lord is King, your Lord and King adore. Rejoice, give thanks and sing, and triumph evermore. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice. Rejoice again, I say rejoice. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we gather this Sunday after Ascension Day and we rejoice in you, our Lord and our King, seated at the right hand of the throne of Almighty God on high. From there you pray over us, from there you sent your Spirit to us, from there you intercede on our behalf, from there you rule over this universe. We thank you for that today. We just bow our knees and we confess with our lips that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God, our Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who planned creation, who planned our redemption, and who's planning our eternal life. Oh Lord, we praise you today. Would you join us in this time together? Speak to our hearts as we seek. We humble and bow ourselves before you. We bless your holy name. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us this Sunday on the calendar. It is the Sunday after Ascension Day, the day of the 40 days that Jesus appeared after his resurrection and uh, he was caught up to heaven. And as the Apostles' Creed says, from thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. He is there as our sovereign Lord, and we sure worship him. Thank you for joining us today. Some of the songs on our playlist today will reflect that, um, and I hope that you will use that tool. The final song is especially selected for after this morning's message, so I hope that you have an opportunity to use that and worship the Lord uh, with those songs. This month, uh, we are supporting the Ministry of the Navigators through two servants of the Lord, Riley and Ryan Call uh, Callahan. They are serving at Eastern Connecticut State University, seeking to share the gospel of Jesus with students and others who are there. And so all of our giving uh, to the specifically designated missions in the month of uh, May is going to support that work. Easiest way to give is uh, online at our website, windhamcenterchurch.com slash giving. There is a PayPal link, and you can set up a one-time gift. You can set up a recurring gift. And uh, as you're there, I just encourage you to take advantage of that opportunity to continue to support the ongoing ministry and work of our congregation. That is what helps us to come to you uh, each time and makes us here for you as you have a spiritual need. And I would just want to thank you for that ahead of time. So we're going to read the passage of Jesus' exaltation this morning. It is from Acts chapter 1, and we're reading verses 1 through 14. <clears throat> In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his sufferings by many proofs, appearing to them during forty days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise from the Father, which he said, You've heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. When he said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who is taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, 
James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas, the son of James. All these, with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Some years later, Paul wrote letters, letters, and he wrote one to the church of Ephesus. And in that, he writes, and it also regards the ascension of Christ, Ephesians 1, beginning with verse 15. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? According to the working of his great might, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Let's pray. Father, as I think of the events of the day that we call Ascension Day, and, and, and this day when we reflect on some of those events, I think of a book title that talked about why you, Jesus, gone away is better than if Jesus had stayed here. I think it's called Jesus Continued. And, and in that book, the author talks about all the blessings that come to us because Jesus ascended to heaven and Lord, you, you reign there now until you come back for us. And I think of those things, Lord, today, and I want to give you thanks for them because since you are there and not here, you can be everywhere. You, you're not limited to just one place at a time as even your resurrected body was. You could only be in a small place. You could only deal with a few people. You're, you were not everywhere. You, and, and so as you are in heaven, um, now, Lord, your presence is available to us no matter where we are, no matter when we are. No matter what we're going through, your presence is available to us. You said it is good that you leave because when you leave, you will send forth the Holy Spirit. And by your spirit working in your word, you work in our hearts and lives. You indwell us. You make us brand new. You change us and you equip us to serve you. And we thank you for that today, O oh Lord. Lord, you intercede for us. You pray for us. You, you continue to speak of your sacrifice on our behalf, the reminder that our sin is paid for, it is finished. And we are forgiven. And so we want to thank you, Lord, that that is ever before the throne of God. And you rule, Lord. Your, your sovereignty is over all creation. Your patience is uh, existing until that time when you come back and that patience will be finished. And the time to accept you, the time to trust you, it will be expired because you will be back. We want to thank you, Lord, for the patience. We, we long for you to come, but there are still so many people that need you, people that we love and care about, and people whom we haven't even met or know yet, who, who need to have a relationship with you. And we thank you, Lord, that your patience is our salvation. Lord, you supervise our work. And you send us forth, and we accomplish amazing things that sinful, finite individuals can accomplish the things that we accomplish because you're at work in us. Oh, Lord, that's an amazing thing. And you send us off. You commission us to do that. 
um, while you are on heaven's throne awaiting your return. So we look forward to the time when we will see you face to face. We look forward to the time when we're going to be with you and we'll be transformed into your glorious likeness. And we will, we will fully realize the reality of being your brothers and being your sisters. Until that time, Lord, help us to keep our eyes fixed on you, our hearts fixed on heaven. As we look to you, the captain and the perfecter of our faith who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising its shame. You are looking forward to that time when you amass your family together. We just thank you for the grace that includes us in that family. Lord, the, the trials and the struggles and the conflicts and the hostilities in the world just multiply around us. But you are Lord over all of those things. So that whether physically speaking, the, the mountains fall into the hearts of the sea and the, the waters roar and foam, or whether spiritually and relationally speaking, all of that kind of turmoil takes place, you reign and you will reign forever. And we just pray that we would be still and know that you're our God that we would be still in our hearts and confess you and proclaim you and embrace you, our Lord, our Savior, our God. Thank you for that today. You speak to our hearts from your word we ask in your most glorious name, Lord. Amen. I'd ask you to turn in your scriptures to Luke chapter 1. You want to be open there, although there's really only one verse that I'm reading right at the moment. It is one verse, and it comes from a conversation that the angel Gabriel uh, had with Mary. And it's Luke chapter 1, verse 38. Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel May God speak to us this morning. Well, nine months after all of that took place, the scene moves to uh, Bethlehem's stable. And Joseph cradles his newborn son in his arms, and, and he looks down on his closed eyes while he's asleep, resting, and and uh, I think his thoughts could probably resemble these lyrics that were written. Now, I'm not one to second guess what angels have to say, but this is such a strange way to save the world. Such a strange way. Such a strange way to save the world. Looking at the little infant in his arms. Lying next to him, an exhausted mother, finally resting, finally sleeping, not just from labor, but all of the turmoil from having to leave Nazareth and getting down to the Bethlehem area, um, but also nine months from the time that Gabriel had spoken with her and she spoke to him. Chapter one of an amazing story has now been written and complete. And you know, she, she spoke to Gabriel and she said, I am the servant of the Lord. Be it done to me as you have said. And what an amazing nine months of living that out she experienced. Be it done to me as you have said. Another songwriter has put that sentiment to words. I offer all I am for the mercy of your plan. Help me be strong. Mary had signed up for God's plan. You know what happened in the story. Gabriel appears to her on a day determined by the Lord, and uh, he said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. She responds with fear to that greeting, and he goes on to say this, Don't be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. 
Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, and he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. And she rightly wonders, how can that be? Because she hasn't been sexually active and she's not married at the time. How is it possible for her to be pregnant? The angel answers. Gabriel says the Holy Spirit uh, will produce that child in you. And she, you know, he talks about Elizabeth, who's in her sixth month of pregnancy. And he, he says this amazing statement, nothing will be impossible with and that's when Mary replies, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Well, she had carried Jesus the nine months, and uh, Jesus was born, and they came to that place in life. And she had finished that part of the journey, as I suggested, chapter one is done. Now I've given him birth. Now I have to figure out how I'm going to raise him. Raising him took place. If only she could see 30 years ahead and what all of the implications of this would be. It, it would be very unimaginable for her. But Jesus grew. He grew. He entered ministry. He served three, three and a half years. He was crucified. And then he rose. And then he ascended. And based on a very, very simple phrase, a simple phrase at the end of the passage that I read earlier, I believe that Mary, the mother of Jesus, became one of Jesus' disciples. And she served with and alongside the 120 who are baptized by the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. Why do I believe that? Because in Acts 1.14, all of these were gathered, were devoted themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. We know of James and Jude, who wrote books in the New Testament. We don't know if the other two brothers uh, became believers or not. But I, excuse me, I am persuaded that Mary is our sister in Christ because of that simple verse in that context. A lot of times, Protestants, and especially evangelical Protestants, and, and those who have come out of Catholicism, and, and especially if they've come out of it in a hard sort of manner, they can be very, very critical of Mary. And I think that is unfair. I remember being on a mission trip over to Ireland, and in Galway, there was a cathedral to our Mary, Our Lady, assumed into heaven. And, uh, and some of the Protestants over there didn't have such a nice name for it. And they went so far as to say the Cathedral of Our Mary assumed to be in heaven because they had a lot of questions about that. Well, it's not Mary's fault that Pope Pius IX decreed in 1854 that Mary herself was somehow immaculately conceived from her mother who Somehow they came up with the name Anne for, because only a sinless vessel could bring forth a sinless child. And hence, Mary needed to be that. But if you really stop to think about that, you start a series. How, why only Mary? Why not her mother? You know, why not back and forth? I mean, it's an interesting idea. The, the logic has some questions, especially theologically. It's definitely the wrong idea. It's also not Mary's fault that Pius XIII um, decreed that Mary was assumed into heaven, which sort of parallels Jesus' ascension. It's not Mary's fault that people have spiritualized her to sort of view her like the Old Testament queen mother. Um, the, the queen mother had a lot of authority over, uh, over the king. We're thinking that Revelation 12, you know, that Jesus gave us Mary kind of as a spiritual mother to intercede for us. It's not her fault when people use the phrase mother of God, which I personally think they should say the mother of the son of God, or call her our co-redeemer, as if she had any role in what happened except for giving birth to Jesus. It's not her fault that people have done that over the years. My honest opinion is that I don't think she would be very happy to take the limelight away from her son. 
All of those ideas are far outside of the limit of Scripture. And unfortunately, as Protestants, as evangelical Protestants, they may keep us from respecting and even giving Mary the, the reverence that she is due, not in the sense of worship, but in the sense of awe and wonder at, at a girl who received this gift from the Lord and served the Lord faithfully and thought, thinking about all that she endured. Mary's a person like you. Mary was a person like you, a, a woman like us, a young woman, a teenage girl, most likely. Some people think as young as 14, possibly. As you read the scriptures, there's only three women of which I can think at the moment who had an appearance by a real angel. And if, uh, if you can think of the other two, message me. I, I don't have a prize for you, but uh, I'd just be interested if you remember who the other two women were. Well, the angel Gabriel spoke to her and very gently to her. He didn't come in a terrifying way, but he certainly gave her a scary message. You, Behold, you favored of God. She, she wondered what kind of greeting this would be. But as he spoke to Mary, if you pay close attention to what he did, Mary, he brings a message that's not a question of God. Mary, would you do this? But rather, Mary, I have chosen you to do this. You shall become pregnant with a child. You shall conceive. You shall give birth. And this will be the son. This is not a question of what I would like to do, Mary. This is what's going to happen. This is what God is planning to do through you and with you and for you. And like another strong woman who on April 20th in 1990 in Littleton, Colorado said, Yes, concerning the Lord and her life, anticipating a most terrible cost in her life, Mary said, yes, be it to me as you have said. I trust you. God, I will receive your plan for my life. I will be a part of that. You may, you may use me as your servant in any way that you deem fit. What a, what a wonderful outlook for, for you and me as Christians, as believers, to have, Lord, be the things in my life be as you say, use me as you want. I, I am your servant. Well, it's not for nothing that some people call Mary the first Christian. It's not for nothing that some people call her the first disciple, because that's definitely the motto of a disciple. Something big is here. She feels it. And as you go on and read and just would look at just a moment, her song in the next chapter, in the next section of Luke 1, something very, very big is here. But, but something even bigger is here than at least Mary describes, but whether she realized or remembered this or not. I mean, she was a good student of scripture as you read the, the song that she sings. But whether she went this far or not, I don't know. Mary is in the line of the fulfilling of God's promise to Eve in Genesis chapter 3. If you remember in Genesis 3, 15, it's after Satan had tempted Eve and Eve led Adam and they both had sinned. And God spoke to the serpent and he said a very strong word. You will, the seed of the woman will bruise you. You will bruise his he, heel. He will bruise or to effect crush your head or destroy you. It's the first word of good news. It's the gospel that the son of the woman would arise and destroy the work of the devil. And now is when it's going to happen. It's sort of like in the movie The Lion King when uh, Rafiki, an advisor to the, to the animals, to the king, um, comes up to Simba, the king's son, and, and he says in that great voice, it is time. And it's to bring Simba home to defeat the, the devil kind of character and his uncle Scar and for the kingdom to be restored. And, and after all of the time from, from uh, Eve now to Mary, it's like the Lord is saying, it's time. 
It's time that promise was made, and now is exactly the moment. What does is, what is Paul write in, the, in Galatians chapter 4? At exactly the right time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the Old Testament law. It is time for God to fulfill those promises. And she, she understood that. Mary understood that. She went off to see Elizabeth, and there, there are so many wonderful facets of this story to, to explore, but we have to pass over that this morning. But Mary comes back with this beautiful song. My soul magnifies the Lord, my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked on the humble state of his servant. For behold, from now on all nations, will, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. She is thinking of the amazing grace and favor that God has poured out on her and, and the privilege that it is that God would use her. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He's shown his strength with his arm. He's scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He's brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his offspring forever. So she's thinking about herself, but she's thinking about God and what his plans are. She's thinking about God and his gracious character, God and his rich and strong promises, God and his covenant agreement. And she has the privilege of participating as a servant of God to make that happen. Be it to me, as you have said. Well, with that prayer comes a lot of life, doesn't it? Because immediately an unplanned pregnancy begins, at least for her, it was an unplanned pregnancy. And can you imagine how she thought about how am I going to tell my parents how am I going to tell my friends? What's going to happen when my neighbors see? How am I going to tell Joseph? And wrestling with that. And, you know, people thought, Joseph thought, that she had been become pregnant by somebody else. And, and that idea didn't actually leave. There are some subtle remarks in the Gospels that uh, she that Jesus was accused of being illegitimate. And uh, it's my understanding that some people thought that perhaps it was a Roman soldier, you know, that fathered him. I think if Joseph had been alive and around, some people would have had some broken teeth or a, or a fat lip, as they would say those things about the joy of his life. But she had to live with all of those things. And it was, a, it was just a part of the offshoot or the fruits of what the Lord was doing. As the time came for her to give birth, uh, they needed to uh, follow the Roman injunction. So there was a trip to Bethlehem that they had not planned. Uh, giving birth in a stable, you know, that's not the ideal place to give birth. The, the visit by the shepherds and the message and the song, certainly that was an encouragement to her. Bringing Jesus to the temple bringing him to the temple to dedicate him when he was a month old. And, and as she did that, they run into a Simeon, a dear, faithful man of the Lord. And Simeon takes Jesus in his arms and he says, Now, Lord, let your servant depart in peace according to your word. My eyes have seen your salvation that you've prepared in the presence of all the peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. That sort of confirms and enhances what Gabriel had said about Jesus to Mary. And then his father and mother marveled, and Simeon blessed them and said, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also so that thoughts from many hearts will be revealed. I'm sure Mary wondered about that. Well, before too long, the Magi came. They gave them their gifts. They enabled them to flee to, to Egypt to escape Herod's wrath. They made it back home and were instructed to go north. And so they went off to the little burg of Nazareth, where Mary and Joseph had been from 
and uh, Jesus is raised. They're there, and over the next years, four little boys at least join them, and uh, two sisters anyway, as we read in the Gospels. And uh, Mary and Joseph practiced a faithful faith, because for 12 years in the Gospel of Luke, we see it was every year they went to Jerusalem for Passover. It was mandatory for the men to go, but Joseph took his family. And, and year by year, they would teach, and he would learn until the 12th year when he is there, and up until this point, he's been just like any boy, going along, seeing what's going on, listening and paying attention. Then all of a sudden, this time he disappears. And, and you know, he finds his way to the temple and he's talking with the religious leaders. And You know, the, the parents come back and they find him there being very, very distraught. And then it says he went down with them and he came back. He came up to Nazareth and he was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. We believe he learned his father's trade and was there until his father died. That's the, the usual understanding of Joseph. And he would have been faithful to the synagogue. He would have been faithful to listen and listen and listen and listen. And you, you have to think that Mary had taught him different things about what God had promised him. And he's listening and he's drinking in God's word. But but the problem is Mary couldn't tell him what was going to happen because she didn't know all of the things that were going to happen. He just was listening to God's word. And then all of a sudden, Elizabeth's son, his cousin, comes on the scene. John the Baptist is preaching and is talking about preparing the way from the Lord. The Lord is going to be coming for his people. And, and hearing those words, that was Jesus' cue. So he came forth for baptism. He began his public ministry. He went in the wilderness, was tempted, and he began in earnest the ministry of discipling his men. Well, early on in that ministry, in John chapter 2, Jesus is invited to accompany his mom and uh, to a wedding in Cana, and a number of his disciples are there. I don't know that he had all 12 of them yet, but he at least had a few. And as they're there at the wedding, you know what happens. The wine runs out, and, and that's a terrible embarrassment to a host. Mary loves her friends, and she turns to Jesus. And she didn't really probably have to say anything. You know, men, if, if you know what happens, your mom looked at you a certain way, you knew you better do what she wanted. Um, just a look, just a look. And uh, I'm thinking that he was looking back and thinking, no, no, no. Well, all she says is do something. You know, do something. She's not being selfish. She's not being um, anything but loving and compassionate towards her friends. She knows, as, as John Murray says, you know, she remembers the words that Gabriel said. She herself prophesied of what Jesus was going to do. She knew of the miracle of the virgin conception. And uh, she had lived life with this little boy as he had grown up and was now a man. Surely, surely this all meant that he could be kind and do something. He, she wasn't asking him to, to do something crazy. Um, there was nothing inherently wrong with asking. But Jesus draws a line. Women were not on the same page here. What, what is between me and you? Your thoughts and your concerns are not the reason that I'm here and what I'm doing. He was not there to simply go around making life better for other people. He was not fixing people's needs or not just taking care of those kinds of problems. Um, and he didn't say it in a way of disrespect. It don't, don't hear the words when he says, Woman, what is there between me and you? My hour has not yet come. It was not time for him to really embark on public ministry that is going to show people who he is and what he did. His message is sort of like this. Mother, you need to think differently now about me. This is my time. And this is not how I begin. This is not how I get up on stage and yell and leap. And, and it's not about being your son doing what you want me to do. It's about being my father's son and doing what he has called me to do. Well, as she turns away, she tells the servants, do what he tells you. She, she trusts him to do the right thing and whatever will, will be. And you, you know what happens. The water 
was for ceremonial washing and large jugs has been manu miraculously transformed into the best wine. And all of the credit goes to the host. All the credit goes to the host. Jesus didn't call any attention to him ex himself. It's only his mother and only the disciples and only the stewards knew what took place. And, and the best wine came out. In, in one sense, it's kind of a quiet way of taking an old but true symbol of Israel's life. And Israel was a vine designed to produce good, good wine, good fruit. And unfortunately, it was not. And Jesus took that symbol and he produced the best fruit. And he produced ample fruit. And he produced a superb fruit. It, Certainly, it's a contrast, a definite, rich, beautiful, fruitful life that springs from what Jesus does. There are really only two other times in the gospel narrative, in the ministry context of ministry, that there's contact. There's a one time when Mary and the disciples are, Mary and, and her sons are nearby, um, and they're looking for him, and, and uh a woman says, your family's here, and Jesus says, the people who do my will, those are, the, those are my family. And there's really only one other time. And, and what you seem to see is that Jesus is saying that the physical relationship isn't the important one now. What's important now is the spiritual relationship that someone has with me and the faith relationship and the following relationship that someone has with me. And so he, he's taken another step back. Mary has to endure that. If you've watched the series The Chosen at all, you've seen how they portray Mary as a frequent part of the entourage around Jesus. And I, I think though they do that in a very, very tasteful way. In truth, it's more than we know. We know very, very little about that. But it feels like it could be in the spirit of how things took place. Um, one of the questions I guess I would think is, what did, what did Mary really think of all this? And she remembered the promises. How much did she put together? It's a little, little hard to do that. I, I have to think she was there and wanted to encourage him. Of course, his brothers thought he was a nut, but Mary remains loyal. Now, I confess that the next is a little bit speculation, but I believe that it would fit in the narrative. Might it not be true that she was there in the background with Mary and Martha when Lazarus was raised? They seem to have been family friends. Or the reason I ask that is because the night before he goes into Jerusalem for the triumphal entry is the feast at Mary and Martha where, they, where Lazarus is there. Um, it's likely, I think, that Mary was present in part because when she shows up in a few days, she can't have just come down from Nazareth. She has to have been in the area. So is it not logical to think that she's been a part of that? Certainly in the area around the events of that last week. And as everything unfolds, we find in John 19, while the soldiers were gambling for Jesus' robe, there were many people, many of the women around the cross, including Mary, the mother of Jesus and others. And at that point, Jesus turns to Mary and says, Woman, behold your son. And to John, son, behold your mother. And he, he assigns her into John's care. Be it unto me as you have said. She prayed that. How can this possibly be part of what God had planned? How can, I, how can I do this? How can I trust? How can I move forward? But she had signed on for the entire trip. She was faithful. And perhaps when after Jesus had breathed his last and was simply hanging on the cross and, and the soldier thrust the sword into Jesus' side, I can just imagine her just flinch and just... Because the word from Simeon, the sword will pierce your own heart also. And, and she would see that this was something known from the very, very beginning. 
I can imagine her thinking, Lord, this isn't what I had wanted to sign up for. I don't understand what you're doing. This is a strange way. I, I don't understand. Help me. Well, she saw him die. She saw him buried, not knowing how this could fulfill any of the promises that God had made. Perhaps she was part of the group of women, if not going, at least helping to arrange the spices to take to the to tomb that after Joseph and Nicodemus had taken care of him the first night. Certainly, she was there with all of this extended group in the upper room as the reports came in of Jesus' appearances to others. You know, and then she would have been there as jo they saw him over the 40 days. And, and the reason that I say that is from the verse that I read before. This was after the ascension and all of those with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and who? And Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. At this point in time, Jesus had appeared to many. We don't know he had a private audience with Mary. We know he had one with his brother James, perhaps he did with Jude, maybe the two other brothers as well, I don't know. But in reading that and then hearing in chapter 2, verse 1, the day of Pentecost arrived and what they were all together in one place. To me, the clear implication is that they were all together. Who was there? Mary was there. Mary was there with the disciples, with the others on Pentecost. Mary was there as tongues resembling fire dwelt on the top of each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. They all spoke in tongues as the Holy Spirit enabled all of them, including this young girl who many years before said, Be it unto me as you have said, for I am your servant. And God truly began to fulfill the promises of which she spoke and of which she sang in a way that she could not have ever thought. And God pro privileged her to now be a vessel of his spirit in new life. And in truth, all generations will be amazed and blessed that here this girl who received this amazing gift from the Lord has now come to know him. As we pull things to a conclusion, I have found some thoughts um, concerning this, this whole area. Mary is a woman who trusted God despite all of her fears, and she was willing to accept his plan and his promise, and she willingly endured the cross. And her mindset was that God was trustworthy when he tells you and me to do something, he's trustworthy, and so we should. We had that simple, genuine faith to know that we can trust him and we need to do what he tells us to do. God doesn't ask you and me to do much of anything, but he tells us and expects us to do a lot. Mary knew God's word. Mary knew God's word as you read that song that she composed that we call the Magnificat. It was an anchor for her. It was praise to God, and she was enabled to see herself as a part of God's bigger plan. You and I as believers in the things that we do and reaching out to others in Jesus saying we are a part of his bigger plan. Maybe God has an even bigger plan for you than just being around where you live. Maybe he has a bigger plan for you being able to be involved. After Acts chapter 2, we never hear of Mary again. There are interesting traditions about what took place, but that's all they are. They're just traditions. And so my take on that is that Mary was content to settle into the background and simply be a follower of Christ. She would simply live alongside the other men and the women who loved the Lord, and she was faithful in the quietness, in the place of unknown living. And she was loyal to him. She was loyal to him to the end when he was on the cross. She was loyal to him, him to the end. She loved him tenderly, and he loved her back. As we see all that Mary experienced, I think this particular truth is very important. 
Mary, the mother of Jesus, needed to know Jesus, not just as her son, but needed to know her, him as her savior. It wasn't enough for Mary to just grow up in proximity to God and the things that he wanted. It wasn't simply enough for her to have a relationship with him as his biological mother. She needed to have a relationship with him through her faith that he was God's son who died on the cross for her sin, was resurrected for her sin, and was raised and sent his Holy Spirit into her life. And then she becomes an example for you and me. No one becomes a Christian because their mom and dad or grandparents or however many generations back are Christians. We are, our faith in God, our relationship with God is not based on our connection with parents or grandparents who have a relationship with God. Our relationship with God is not based on a spouse who has a relationship with God or children after us who have a relationship with God. Our relationship with God is based on ourselves and our recognition. So it's not about, it's not about a religious upbringing. It's not about some kind of a religious pedigree. It's not about any of that. What it is truly about is that we, like Mary, recognize that Jesus died on the cross for our sin. Jesus was raised on the third day. Jesus has ascended into heaven, and he is the Lord. And once that reality is in our heart, then we can join Mary in saying, I am. I am your servant, Lord. I am your servant. Use me as you think right. I am your servant, Lord. I want to fit into your plan. Even when I don't understand it, I want to trust you. I am your servant, Lord. I want to know that your promises are true. They will happen in your way and in your time. And there is nothing that you cannot do. I am your servant, Lord, and whether if whether life is in the public view or whether life is away from the lights and the crowds and the influence, I want to be faithful. I want to be faithful to you until the day you call me. The resurrection of Christ, the life of Christ, is what turned Mary from just that servant who brought him into the world to someone who knew him as her savior. And she was no longer just his mother, she became his sister. And uh, I believe she's there and we're gonna have an opportunity to, uh, to talk with her. But, but may, may we take from her the faith that started her journey. Lord, may it be to me, as you have said, and especially on this side of the cross, on this side of the resurrection, on this side of Jesus ascended for you and me, how much more appropriate if, if we confess, we say and believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and we confess that, is that not saying those words, be it to me as you desire? I yield to you. Lord, receive us. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for the example of Mary. We thank you for her willingness to enter a very unknown life with a lot of peril. We know nothing about all of those days, but I, I have to believe those were often hard days through her pregnancy. And then when your ministry was coming to a conclusion and the cross. But I thank you, Lord. I, th I thank you that we see her with disciples. We see her as the Holy Spirit comes. And we see the one who was your mom. You were her son. But she turned to you and trusted you as her Savior. Lord, we want to continue to trust you as our Savior. And as our risen Lord and Savior, help us to say and mean, be it unto me as you have promised. And use me, Lord. 
I am your servant. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you haven't listened to the music already, I hope now you will at least listen to a Mary Did You Know from the perspective of Mary around the cross. And even thinking of Mary as the Holy Spirit came and her life came, and just think of it looking back, not so much when he was an infant, but now that everything has happened, looking back. And uh, and see if that doesn't speak to your heart a little bit differently. God bless you today and uh, all this coming week. Amen.